Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Matt Johnson. We are back with another episode of Real Estate Uncensored. This is the place where you get actionable ideas, insight, and inspiration to turn your real estate career into a life of freedom. And we have an amazing and very special episode today mm -hmm. because we're talking with the co-authors of a book all about the crash. It's called Easy Money and the American Real Estate Ponzi Scheme. And we're going to talk about what the crash was like from the inside, uh, where we might be at today in the whole scheme of things economically and in the real estate cycle, and why home ownership isn't for everybody and why agents might actually be doing a disservice to their clients by pushing them that direction when it's actually not right for them, uh, which I know Greg McDaniel will yell at me about and I will yell I at will. him right back along with uh, my two guests. So we're <laughs> going to have a lot of fun today and we might actually get into uh, some uh, some of our favorite books on economics and politics and stuff like that. And uh, so we're going to we're gonna gang up on Greg. So this is going to be a fun episode. Uh, mm -hmm. Greg is going to just stay Bite silent. Um, <laughs> no? Bite me. No? no I am, right. I'm going to chime in here, pal. All right. but, but I have to give you like a proper introduction. The junior right, grandmaster ahead. himself. Yes. In the yes. co-pilot seat. I shall enter team. now. Thank you, Sir, Sir Matthew. All right. Hey, dude. Awesome. <laughs> your, your liege. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> I am honored and a little petrified, Matt. Remember, we had a conversation last night for quite a while on a myriad of different topics, one of which is the McDaniel Challenge. And uh, guys, I am officially renouncing the McDaniel Challenge. It is officially on pause. I am honored and uh, a little kind of scared because I'm in the middle to the end of February of 2018 right now. And I still have uh, about 30 more people to book. Guys, I got to pause it. It's, it's too far out. But we are announcing the jump the line. Okay, guys. Now there are certain Thursdays that um, if you got you, and this is this you guys have got to watch us live to take advantage of Jump the Line. If you guys are signed up for the McDaniel Challenge and you don't want to wait a year to a year and a half almost, you, literally that's seriousness. No, I'm not kidding. Um, then on on Wednesdays like today when we do our show, if you are live and I have a Thursday slot open, I will say, okay, guys, we're doing the Jump the Line. Go, and you have to message me the first one to message me with the date. That you had your uh, that you have your uh, McDaniel challenge will then you automatically be moved up to that Thursday, okay? So you guys, that means you have to tune in live, you have to watch us live, and you have to interact with me. But if you want to jump the line, do it, guys. I cannot wait to talk to you, and I'm blessed and honored that so many of you have come out and asked for training. It is a humbling, humbling thing. So thank you, but stop it. It's going to be two years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, but stop it. That may be the best line of the show. All right. So <laughs> that's not, probably let's let's just call it right there. We've yeah, the show's good. We're just gonna call it right there. So uh, so let's bring in our two Final special laugh. guests. Exactly. Uh, so first of all, we've, we've got John Agostinelli with us, uh, who you guys may recognize from being a member of Lead Gen Scripts and Objections. I'm sure you've seen some of his posts. Uh, he is a, uh, a broker in, in the East Coast. We also have his real estate book co-author, Chris Michaud. And Chris, let's start with you, Chris. Um, give us the uh, kind of the 60 second bio on who you are, where you are, and what you do. So I'm in the uh, Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts, which is contiguous to the Metro West area where John is. And I've been in the real estate business in three different states over 30 years. And uh, John and I got together and we both saw this debacle coming, this uh, housing recession coming. And we started to position ourselves. We met uh, when we were speaking at a local, not a local franchise, it was a national franchise. And uh, we liked what each other said. We were both on the same plane and we said, hey, why don't we partner up? And that's what we did. So. I've done about everything in real estate. I've done land development. I've done uh, flipping houses. I've owned several businesses. I've, I've owned several franchises, had lots of agents work for me in the past. And uh, John and I together did this uh, REO business. We uh, were appointed to uh, LPS's broker council. Uh, 14 brokers throughout the country out of 6,000 were appointed there. John and I and I each cons uh, served uh, different consecutive terms. So um, we decided to write the book uh, because we were seeing the disconnect between what the media was saying was happening and what John and I were seeing in the field. Right. We went from zero listings and after cold calling for six months uh, we went from zero listings to about 100 within about nine months' time. 
Uh, John's <laughs> got the details on that, I think, better than yeah, I do. That's so. a little, nice little eye-popping number. I like that, yeah, Teeth. Well, let, let's throw it over to yeah. you, John. So a little a little background on, on yourself, and then we'll get into the cold calling part because I know people will be curious about that. Sure, sure. Uh, so I graduated uh, with a business degree and a concentration in finance. And the first nine years of my career, I was in the banking industry. Seven of those years were at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, better known as the FDIC, where I was investigating the causes of bank failure and uh, then moved over into the foreclosure unit. And I was managing foreclosures in three New England states. Uh, <clears throat> during that time, it was a great experience, but I was getting sick of the W-2 world. Um, and in 1997, I purchased a piece of land at a foreclosure auction and built my first spec home. And within months of selling that spec home, I left the corporate world and uh, went into the business for myself. And in 1998, um, a year after I sold that first spec home, I got my broker's license and I was primarily listing my own spec homes. And I was building spec homes up until the real estate market turned. And for my market, which is the Metro West area of Boston and Massachusetts, really between Boston and Worcester, um, the market turned early. It was probably about mid-2005, and I had two spec homes up. And fortunately, I was able to sell both of them in the black, uh, but I saw that the profitability was falling, and I was, yeah. had to decide, okay, what's my next move? Um, building spec homes is not where it's at, at least at this stage of the market. So I purchased a World Properties International franchise. Uh, Chris also purchased a franchise, and like he said, that's where we met. And we decided to pool our experience to uh, solicit the banks. And getting into that cold calling piece, we were really ahead of the curve in soliciting banks for their bank-owned inventory because the crap really hadn't hit the fan on a national level. And um, so we cold called for a good three to six months with no success and we were knocking on banks' doors. We showed up at corporate headquarters unannounced. And, <laughs> and, and we were shocked. We were really shocked at how many people were willing to meet with us. But what we learned is that a lot of the local lenders um, were portfolio lenders, and they just used uh, better uh, underwriting criteria in, in their mortgages, and they were not these higher-risk uh, mortgages. Anyways, uh, so they didn't have the inventory of foreclosures to give you guys. Yeah, they didn't have the inventory. Now, remember, this is in, we started this solicitation in early 2007, and it was really yeah, you guys before. Were ahead of the curve. Yeah, we were ahead of the curve, yeah. and um, so ultimately, we made this connection with Lender Processing Services. They were the largest mortgage servicer in the country. Uh, they gave us five listings. We put all five of them under agreement in that first 30 days. And they said, okay, these guys are the real deal. Let's see what they could do. And within, I don't know, from that point, within six to nine months, we, we ramped up to uh, just about 100 properties with that one client alone. And then we added Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and about 15 other lenders too. And they just kept, like, kept leveraging up based on client like, right. success once, and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Once we, yeah. we had lender processing services, it was easy to, to get Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and some of the other larger lenders and it really worked better anyways because the local lenders would have given us one listing here one there we really got okay. some economies of scale of working with one client we knew how they wanted their broker price opinions done we knew their systems we knew how they wanted it done yeah and, there, and there's a couple lessons there but i want to go deeper number one is just the lesson of freaking to keep knocking on doors until you bust one of them down because even it sounds like the lender processing service that was the initial door that you busted down mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't seem like it was a huge door but that's what led to all the other stuff and you keep leveraging up based on the success of one client into another but uh, I, I want to go off on a little bit of a tangent real quick uh, to see if we can you know deliver some really some really practical tips to the agent on the street right now that has some listings or, or they're about to take a listing. Was there anything that you guys felt like you did differently than other agents at that time to get those properties under contract quickly versus what, uh, what other people were doing? Sure. Uh, def I'll definitely. Take, I'll take a stab at this one, Chris. Go ahead. Uh, so, so there are a couple things. Um, I think a lot of the, the REO brokers early on, I don't know, it seemed like they wanted to keep the inventory to show that they had so many listings. And Chris and I were all about listing the property at market value and if possible, try to get multiple 
offers and liquidate the property right away. We thought it was in our own best interest, but certainly the best interest of the client too, because they had so many of these properties. And when it's listed appropriately and you have multiple offers situation, quite often the property ends up selling for more than it's truly worth. Okay. Yeah. So you got, you guys prove that strategy works. And so the, the other agents were kind of a, do you think they're going for the buyer leads off of the listings or just an ego well, trip off the, off the numbers of listings? My, uh, my, my own opinion is that uh, John alluded to it was that felt that if they took the, the property at a higher price, they would keep the inventory and they wouldn't have to worry about the uh, vendor selecting another agent. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what servicers needed is they needed to turn inventory. And John and I have been through two or three of these cycles. So we knew uh, John worked with the FDIC. I had used, I used to work with the FHA uh, a couple of cycles ago. So we knew what was happening and they needed to dump inventory. So they were thinking they were, a lot of them are rookie agents. And so yeah, they, just didn't do homework, uh, they were thinking, they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So pr pricing them aggressively, going after multiple offers, um, and, and really just having, you know, uh, more of a similar pricing strategy as you, as you would if as if they were a private client that needed to get out of sure. that listing in a timely manner. So that makes sense. Okay. Uh, that's right. That's so when, when you're doing, go back to the cold calling a little bit. Uh, so where were you guys, where did you guys know who to call and, and how did you get through to the right person? Because I know a lot of people have that question, whether it's just dealing with an absentee owner of an investment property and that sort of thing. It's just how do you get through to the right person to talk to? So what did you guys find work for you? Perseverance, stick to it. <laughs> <What? laughs> yeah. So you had it. it no one likes hearing no, and it's uncomfortable to call someone out of the blue, but, and you stumble, but you learn. And just having conversations with whoever answered the phone, we tried to ask for the REO department. There was no REO department at most of these banks at that time. They were uh, basically, the commercial lenders were, were handling the work out themselves. Then later as the game went along, um, it would end up in a workout group. So we weren't sure who to ask for, and it was different at each bank. But just having the conversations, explaining who we are, who we were, what our product differentiation was, because what we witnessed with the sale of the bank owned properties, we saw grass three feet high. We saw, you know, <laughs> right. it, it looked they're like just a not, they're not doing the fundamentals, essentially. They, they did nothing. And so we were trying to offer a higher level of service by uh, having the list of subcontractors ready, uh, put, put a, invest a little money on, on this property, and you're going to get a, a greater rate of return. You're going to be able to sell the property quicker. So we were, we were focusing on product differentiation. Gotcha. Yeah. And the interesting part of that, I think that a lot of people skip over and anytime they get into a new business is they don't know, they don't know what they don't know and they don't know how to go about finding what they don't know. Uh, yes. And John, you kind of had the advantage. I mean, both of you guys have years of experience, but you didn't just have years of experience on the outside as a run of the mill agent. You mm -hmm. kind of seen it. It sounds like from the inside looking out. And so you knew what the priorities were, what the fears and the pain points were of the actual specific people you were talking to and pitching this stuff to. Sorry. And neither one of us are afraid of the phone. I'm sure that helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Uh, so first of all, before we really dig, dig into this stuff, um, how do people, is, is the book, when, when, I guess, when does the book come out and what's the best way to get it? So we just December got off 10th. the phone with our publisher um, a day or two ago. So the, the published date is December 10th. Um, there are two websites you can go to, easymoneyinamerica.com or easymoneyamerica.com. You can go to the website. Uh, you can't yet order the book. It will be on Amazon probably within a week or two. Um, but we have a, a newsletter that you can sign up for if you're interested in the book, if you like what we have to say here today. Um, sign up for the newsletter, and once the book is available, we're going to naturally blast it on social media, and we're going to reach out to our uh, database. But uh, anyone that's interested can just fill out that form and, and they'll be on the list for us to contact. Cool. And Greg, and, what, and what do you take away links. from... What's that? What's that, Chris? Uh, site links to our individual websites too. Oh, okay, great. Excellent. 
Yeah, see there. So on, on easymoneyamerica.com, for example, you've got the about about the authors, you've got all of their social media and website links <clears throat> with uh, with your guys' bios as well. So yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, Greg, Greg, anything else that you pull from uh, from just the story of how they how they persevered through the crash? And, you know, I mean, I, I know I would, if I would have known those guys back then, I would have done a lot of things differently. So what lessons can the average agent draw from that, that if we go through another down cycle, how can they learn from what these guys have gone through to not repeat what you and I did, which was go down to bankrupt or near bankrupt and losing houses, losing cars, et cetera, et cetera. Number one thing I would say for an average agent right now is don't spend all your money. Just because the sun's out doesn't mean you need to spend all your, all, all the hay, you know? Um, is my voice, is my sound bouncing all over the place again? Uh, it's not bouncing, but I'm raising your level up because you're a little low. Okay. This is um, the one and only time I will ever do that. <laughs> I will never like, again turn no. up the just heads up. I know, I know. Um, now you've seen the light. The sun shines. Yes, it is. Finally, you've seen the light. Welcome, my son. You can sit anywhere you I like. I believe the sun is being blocked out by the a flock of pigs flying right now. <laughs> Uh, anyways, what I would do, guys, if there, if and when there is another downturn, I believe that the you know the banks and everybody have put precautions into place to you know stop gap you know such a fast drop again. And of course, you guys are going to talk talk to us about it. You've done the research on it, um, but I would definitely no matter what have a savings and then do what you need to do these guys you guys did six months with no with not with no leads you got to diversify yourself start doing your marketing and, and and your prospecting in different new fun ways you know do facebook lives do periscopes uh do go into neighborhoods use a uh, neighborhood scout use uh, homing in you not homing in use um a home snap use these sites and become different and bring content and and and, and quality content i guess into uh, into the neighborhoods so that people will want to listen to you and not just be preached at by you there's a, there's a very large yeah, difference start, start building up the trust now if someone things start happening you have a voice and you have an audience that wants to know what you have to say yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's why Matt and I work work so well. I mean, I built up a lot of backlog. So when Matt and I have a falling out, which never happens, you know what? We can we can grow through our business growth together. And I can go like I can go back to my little treasure trove and be like, I got a nugget of goodness. I can I can live off of this for a little while longer. No. <laughs> Between the cold, <laughs> saving up for the cold, hard winter, the, the sarcastic months. Um, yes, yeah. the sarcastic months. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would agree. With that. I mean, start, start diver, diversifying uh, what I've noticed from top team leaders. I mean, even Jeff Cohn, if anybody knows uh, who he is and how, how I'm involved with him and his team. So he went back in after two and a half years of being completely out of production, went back and started taking listing appointments again and reactivating his database just in case started going on listing presentations again. Now he doesn't service the listing after the, the initial presentation. He keeps a spelt 75% split and pays somebody <laughs> else to do the actual work. Um, but he keeps those relationships going with his database so he's not turning down business. So he always has a stopgap. Um, I was talking to uh, you know the CEO of Viral Marketing, Frank, the other day. He was telling me a little bit about his his backup plan has always been you know one on one high dollar consulting, and now he has 450 potential clients. That if something horrible happens and everybody of Viral Marketing cancels, he has a stopgap, and he knows that his income at least is secure. He may not be able to pay 50 employees, but he knows that his income and his family is secure. Uh, so all these guys, like the high level guys, they're already thinking ahead and they have that plan in place. Uh, the question is, do we, the, the run of the mill people that are out there in the trenches, do we have that plan and we need to start putting that stuff, uh, that stuff in place? Because I want to get into kind of where we're at. Greg, do you want to shout out some people before we, uh, before we get into that and really dive into the kind of the, the economy and kind of where things are going? Yeah, hold on. I'm actually okay. doing working on that right now. Oh my God, you guys! I put a post into Facebook, the Lead Gen Scripts and Objections page yesterday about one-on-one -on -one coaching. The overwhelming uh, response has been unprecedented. Thank you beyond belief. But I want to say to, I can't say hi to everyone. You know, Rafael, M Michael, Donna, Matt, Linda, Rachel, Simone, Randall, uh, Jordan, Submit, uh, Jennifer, Barbara, Barbara Ann, Aaron, Heather, Scotty. Encardo, John, Rebecca, Roberta, Sean, Tia, Teen, Craig, John, Stephanie, Jason, Linda, Paul. Guys, the list just keeps going on. You guys know. Dude, I didn't even get through half of it. I mean, and you guys are epic. I mean, thank you for the. That soup, goodness. I have so much more to go. You guys know who you are. Thank you beyond belief. I'm looking forward to it. And tonight, Matt, tonight I am honored to talk with Tom 
Um, and we are just going to have a rock star on the McDaniel, Call McDaniel Callahan. Oh, my God. The McDaniel Challenge uh, is a one-hour coaching thing, which we will get into never again because we're putting it on pause. Okay. Right, right. So nobody will ever know from here on out what it is. Anyway. All right. So, guys, check out our website, McDanielRealEstateSystems.com. There's two things to check out. Number one is Greg's Favorite Scripts. That's a free download. Uh, it's all of Greg's Favorite Scripts, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it is the script itself plus a video link to where I actually recorded a video of Greg going through the script so you can hear the phrasing and the tonality, which is the important part. Uh, and then the other thing to check out on the site is our video training course, High Tech, High Touch uh, Real Estate Farming. So that is where I sat Greg down and I squeezed his brain out uh, like squeezing a banana out of a tiny slit in the, uh, in the, in the, in the skin. Just squeezed it out. Uh, I, I mashed it a little bit first and I got all the goodness out and on to eight and a half hours of video training. Uh, so it's everything from how to select your geo farm, how big it should be, your turn, turnover rates, how to tell if there's a dominant agent, all the way to how to prospect it, do events, use Zillow. Everything is there. Um, it will melt your face. Just beware. Uh, it's a, it's a lot, it is a lot of content. Um, like, it is everything you need to know to get started with farming. So that's on the website. So just wanted to briefly mention that. But anyway, oh, uh, God, and I'm enjoying uh, having, I'm, ha I'm going to have to get a list of fruits uh, to come up with. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, ha I'm running out of fruit to mention when I, when I give that, uh, that description of how I so, squeeze Greg's brain. So Matt, actually, so what you're saying is essentially like the, that training program, when you look into it, it's like looking into the Ark of the Covenant and if you're not, your, your fate will just melt off. <laughs> yeah, it's Indiana like that. All right. So let, let's get back to, uh, to John and Chris, because I want to get into, into this and, and maybe Chris will start with you. Uh, where, where are we kind of sitting at in, in the big scheme of things? You know, as, as we record this, for those of you that are not, not watching or listening live, uh, this is November of 2016. We have just elected President Trump. Um, and if you don't remember that, pick yourself up off the ground where you are currently laying. <laughs> in and the fetal position. Up, uh, and, or in the fetal position, and uh, depending on your political <laughs> persuasion, and stand up. Uh, because, yes, we have a President Trump. And what in the world is going to happen now? So, Chris, where do you, where do you see us? And wh where do you think kind of the near future is going? Well, so... Uh, the, uh, you know, there's some, something called the real estate cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have it in our book and we talk at length about the real estate cycle. And is you have a recession, you have an expansion, you have a contraction, and then you have expansion. And then where we are right now is we're in the expansion phase. Be an upward swing exactly where we are exactly where you are but john and i are projecting that we're not going to see the peak 20 to 2024 you're not going to see the peak until that's where we are before really now why yeah. okay so yeah. and chris so, if you want to keep going you can answer this or we can switch to john what sure. why do you guys sure. think we're not because i'm i've I have another client uh, who is firmly convinced that we have reached the end of quantitative easing and yes. essentially all the measures that we have in our little arsenal to kind of kick the can down the road. Uh, and yes. they've been kind of desperately holding on throughout uh, to just limp across the finish line to the election before something bad happens. So you guys don't feel like we're, we're at that phase yet, right? No. Uh, and what we had in the last cycle and what we have now is a lot of uh, loose underwriting standards and that we've been uh, the government's been loosening up underwriting standards and there's a tremendous amount of pressure by politicians to continue that process <laughs> housing advocacy groups the real estate industrial complex of which we're a part right. and there's a lot more manipulation that can go on and that's exactly what happened uh, last real estate bubble so you know you have you really should buy the book that one chapter alone <laughs> <laughs> worth thousands of dollars. It's really a little, Buy the a little self promotion. Yeah, kidding. exactly. Shameless. I, like I love it. Oh, that's, right. that's my real style. estate runs roughly in roughly real estate runs in eighteen year cycles. Okay. So, so that's John and I have done the research. Yeah, John yeah, and I yeah, have done I'm the research about that because it's uh, a lot of historical cycles. Because you could say the same thing about. Um, what would you say? Some of the uh, the fiat money debacles in the 1800s. Like it seemed like everything ran in, in cycles, but now that I think the uh -huh. cycles have, at least in terms of the years between them, started to, to speed up. So I can see that they may run in 18 year cycles, but you never know when the next one may be shorter. Do you guys feel like that 18 oh, year could. cycle has some reasons yeah. behind it that will that will continue to hold? 
All right, from 1925 to 1973, that was an aberration. But you have to mm. examine why that was an aberration. It was okay. an aberration because in 1929, we had the depression, the market crash. Then we had a depression, not a recession, but a depression for the next nine years. Then we were immediately into World War II. We artificially kept the prices down and rationed uh, right through into 1946 after the war. Mm -hmm. We had to rebuild the rest of the world, and so our factories uh, were humming like no other factories in the world because we had the last man of factories left. Yeah. Lasted until about the early 70s, and then we had that big recession. But if you look historically, so before the 2007 peak, the uh, it was 1989 when the when the bubble before that occurred. Okay. So, thing to keep in mind though, when we talk about these real estate cycles, and when you read the literature about the real estate cycles, you'll find that from market to market alluded to something earlier and I'll let him talk about that is in his market it actually differed by about two years the whole state its peak was hmm. so markets can within the same general geographic area so I'll let I'll let John tell you about what happened in his Metro West area yeah, with his construction do. John what did you see all right, so so like Chris said, uh, the markets, there is no such thing as a national market. There's a yeah. national average based up on all of the markets. Now, markets are, are uh, regional. Uh, you can even break it down closer to town. It's a uh, price point and property type. So when we talk in general terms about the real estate cycle, what might be happening in Boston, Massachusetts is not what's happening in Las Vegas and it's not what's happening in Detroit and it's not what's happening down in Miami. So it's important for people to understand that when we're, we're talking, we're talking in global terms on, a, on an average basis, but yeah. the markets don't operate like that. So just to, keep, to get back into that 18 year cycle, with, the theorist uh, came up with this way back in the, uh, before uh, 1900. And the most re so the most recent cycle was also 18 years. The cycle prior to that was 10. Now, barring anything can happen, there could be a world war or catastrophic event or, God forbid, another significant terrorist attack. That could throw right. everything out of whack. But what we believe is that there is plenty of room for politicians, for the real estate industrial complex, and housing activist groups to push their influence and continue to erode underwriting standards. So we're seeing it right now. Uh, Fannie and Freddie now uh, are allowing up to 97% LTD. FHA is at 96.5. Debt to income ratios can be as high as 57% um, with FHA. And really? now, oh yeah. So uh, they, they're so doing those things today. Before leading so, up to you know, 05, 06, 07. Right, and this, the, the erosion is continuing as we speak because FICO just came out with a new model of how to um, come up with a credit score for someone, and, okay. it, and it pushes the average score higher. So instead no of, way. So instead, oh, of instead of saying, yes. okay, um, you know, six... So now, six wait, wait. Now, now we have all these, and a lot of these, like rocket mortgage and stuff like that, a lot of these mortgage, like automatic or artificial intelligence loan approval processes are based on credit scores, right? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so LTD. now we have a model that's revising it and making it easier for people to raise their credit score when actually nothing about the, the fundamentals of their life have changed. The fundamentals have not changed. And this is in part, I think, the push for they're talking about, uh, Finney and Freddie have been talking about using alternative methods of credit scores. So what does what does that mean? So alternative the, methods. Alternative <laughs> method means so they sell it that they they don't like the monopoly that FICO has on it, right? But the mm -hmm. reality is it's just another way to make someone that's not credit worthy fall in the credit worthy box. So anyways, this is really what we're talking about. There's so much erosion that can still take place that is all supply side. 
So maybe whoever you were speaking to in their particular market, it's possible that they're at the peak or close to the peak. But on uh, a national average basis, we don't think it's going to happen until 2020 to 2024. And it's going to be impacted by Trump. And there's a big question mark as to what are his housing policies. Uh, he was a commercial real estate guy. I'm not sure what his uh, level of knowledge or expertise is in, in regards to governmental housing policy. That, yeah, yes. let, let's def define a couple of, of things for us. So, what, what number one? What do you mean by real estate industrial complex? Before we okay, go so yeah, so the real estate industrial complex it consists of the National Association of Home Builders, the National Association of Realtors, um, a couple of other uh, is the Mortgage Bankers Association. I think is part of it. So these are all groups that have constituents or members that have a vested interest to do anything to prop up house value. So real estate agents make more if a property is selling for 500000 instead of 400000 the, the mortgages are bigger, so um, anyone that's in the mortgage bigger, uh, business makes a, a bigger piece of the pie. So there are a lot of vested interest groups that are self-motivated to do anything to prop up housing. Yeah, and 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 here's here's one of the, the the things that I wanted to get across to people, and I think you guys would agree with me that there is a big belief, uh, I think, on, among common people, and it's reinforced and, and constantly put out there by the media, that one of the main underpinnings of our whole economy is confidence. And if we just keep the confidence up there, the spending keeps going, and then the spending then creates wealth. So if we just keep the confidence up everything will be fine and bad things happen when confidence comes down. And mm -hmm. I don't know where I, it all comes from. You know, I, I ultimately, I think it's all rooted in Keynesian economics. I think you guys would probably agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. But we don't have to go down that rabbit hole because that's a whole <laughs> thing. Uh, and I'm not going to write on the chalkboard Keynes um, at, like Econ 101. But um, yeah, it, it's a very weird perception. So we have this idea that well, all we have to do is if we just convince everybody that everything is okay and now is a great time to buy, sell, or invest, mm -hmm. then everything will be fine because all that matters is the belief that everything is fine keeps everything fine. I don't know why. It, it's, it's a very weird thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's dive into the conversation of kind of like how do, you, how do you advise your clients and be a trusted advisor for them in a climate where we're probably, we're in some, some phase of expansion, like real estate teams are growing, people are doubling and tripling their numbers, uh, and we know this can't go on forever. We know that the, the average list price of everybody's commissions cannot just go up and up and up forever. Uh, we cannot endlessly expand the real estate teams and do 200, then 400, then 1,000 transactions and expect that we're just going to keep on uh, mm -hmm. growing. So, so when, you're, when you're the individual agent and you're working with a client and their question is, should I buy, sell, or invest, what, John, let's start with you. Just knowing what you know, how do you take somebody through that process of really figuring out, is it the right move for them based on the things that you know are going around in the background, but they don't care about? All they care about is their sure. life and the local market. So how do you kind of handle that? Sure. I guess it really depends on if, if we're talking about a homeowner or if we're talking about a real estate investor. So okay. let's we'll start with the I, homeowner. I, we'll, we'll start with the homeowner. So great. Um, what I think is, uh, has happened in the past is that anyone that says that home ownership might not be a great investment will, will be hissed at, right? So, <laughs> yeah, they will. I, I, know, I mentioned that to Greg, and he about, uh, he about knocked the webcam off of his computer trying to get at me. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tread lightly then because I don't want to get anyone upset at me. Um, but if you look at it, it over the last 100 years, um, homes have appreciated at between 0.3% and 0.7% greater than inflation, right? Now, that's assuming that the government is... Assumption. Well, the, assuming that the government is not uh, misleading us about inflation, which I, I believe that they are, and yeah. I think many people believe it. The government uh, mislead us? No. I say it's not true. I, I don't oh, believe that no. for a second. Yeah. So There's weird. no way they would ever fudge numbers that would make them look bad. <laughs> so, so the point is, so whether it's 0.3 or 0.7 or 1% uh, on average over the last 100 years above the rate of inflation, that's not a great investment, especially if you take into consideration the operational costs of the house. So you have transaction costs when you buy or sell. You have the maintenance costs of owning the property. Um, and you have um, the real estate tax. So when you factor those things in, it really makes the real rate of return on owning a home on average 
negative. Now, of course, if you buy at the bottom of a cycle and sell at the top of the cycle, you, it can be a great investment. So it, it runs the gamut. But I think it's important to be truthful with the client so they understand and they can make decisions. They're going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's important if people understood that it's not a great in financial investment, maybe they're not going to buy a $750,000 house. Maybe they'll just buy what they need for their family and buy a five hundred or a $550,000 house and not put themselves in, in um, a financial situation where they might not, if, if save for a rainy day, if you will. Well, yeah, and, and that's what I kind of wanted to, to get into a little bit is some of the crazy things that you guys seen people doing in the lead up to the crash because they're, the assumption is, or if, if you base everything off the assumption that my house is never going to decrease, it's always going to increase in value, that's when you have these crazy, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get pre-approved for the highest amount that I can get, get the most house I can possibly can because I know it's going to appreciate and I'll take the equity out or I'll just wait until I know I'm going to get this promotion in six months and then I'll really be able to afford it. Uh, I mean, it just seems like there, there was a lot of crazy things and we in the real estate business did not do much to stop it and may have uh, encouraged it <laughs> thinking because we're part of the same, we're influenced by the same media. We, we think and believe a lot of the same things as the general public does. We thought it was in their best interest too. We're not looking at it as a business. We're not looking at it as a financial advisor would look at it saying, this is not an asset on your balance sheet. You no, know, it's even more critical today. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first got in the business in the seventies, it's high, high inflation. In the early 80s, I had a mortgage for 16%. It's <laughs> higher than that. Yeah. yeah. So, and I, I, I think they were doing that predatory lending. You think? <laughs> so, in an era of high interest rates and high inflation, to leverage. And so, when the market came back down, interest rates got reasonable at the 10% level. <laughs> you know, uh, people made a lot of money. But we're in different times now. And what's happened is politicians and housing advocates have exploited this pink cloud thinking that you were alluding to earlier. Oh, yeah, it's never going to go down. If, if you may recall, and just before the last bubble, the chief economist for the realtor organization wrote a book. Oh, don't worry. The house, house prices are not going to fall. We're going to have enough mm -hmm. immigrants coming into the country. They're going to need housing forever. We're going to have 450 million people by 2050. Uh, everything's going to be glorious. Isn't that the real dumb. estate cycle hit? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> isn't that isn't that just gumdrops and you know unicorns? I mean, how 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 nice is that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. But, and yeah, so, but that, that's what happens when you have. Cat, what would you call that? Captured, captured economists. But, Essentially, there are people who are employed right. by people that have a uh, they have a certain viewpoint. So, of course, the economists that they have on staff are going to be pressured slash employed to put out news that falls within uh, you know that that suits their their agenda, their their viewpoint. So it, it's it's it, human nature. It's natural. And plus, they don't you know if if you understand the more you understand economics and business, you realize that a lot of the people that are chief economists of this and that have just a completely different model of looking at the world and they're often wrong. And so when they, when someone well, like well, Ben Bernanke predicts in 06 or 07 that nothing's wrong and there is no housing bubble or whatever it was that he said. Yeah. And then immediately, like I think at the time right. when he said that we weren't in a recession, it was like the middle of the month that ended up being the two months that defined that we were in a recession. It was something crazy like that. Like we were in, we were, it had already started when he said that. That's right. That's right. And, yeah. And to your point, uh, Matt, uh, that's so these experts, the chief economist of the National Association of Realtors, who are the other media outlets going to quote? Are they going to quote John Augustinelli and Chris Michaud that's saying we're at the peak of the market or whatever the reality is? Or are they going to quote who everyone knows, the chief economist of the National Association of Realtors? So it's it's this snowball effect that happens. And the, so a lot of us understand what's really going on. Unfortunately, um, the average homeowner is inundated with false or uh, misrepresented information. Mm -hmm. and, and big financial decisions are based on that. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, and, and often that's what- for, Often for political ends. Yes, yes, 100%. The reason why they get told this stuff is for political ends. Yep. 
So what you're saying is we're just basically fucked. <laughs> is, that, is that right? It's not exactly, not exactly my language, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So well, and this is why we, we in the real estate business need to be educated. It's our mm -hmm. responsibility to educate ourselves. Uh, which is why I wanted to bring you guys in and into the show and, and I wanted to give the book exposure because the book presents a Thank point you. of view that number one I think is correct and number two that you will never hear or or at least not given serious credibility on mainstream news no matter what political stripe it is because unfortunately Democrat or Republican alike a lot of times their agendas line up which is to push home ownership in some form or fashion for some, whether it's for whatever group they happen to be siding mm -hmm. with, they always, the, the belief is that home ownership is a key path to generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And therefore anything that promotes home ownership, even just the vanity metrics of home ownership is in and of itself a good thing. Uh, unfortunately it's not. Cause like John, you pointed out, if we're doing things like revising FICO scores and we're doing all this, these, these mental gymnastics with ourselves, to try to make people that aren't really qualified appear qualified, we're not changing the fundamentals of, of their life. We're not making them really more likely to make their mortgage payment. We're mm -hmm. just changing how we look at it. And then we, and then there are people that make all kinds of decisions based on that reality as if that was affecting the fundamentals of how likely these people are to pay their bills. Uh, and it doesn't change the fundamentals. You can't fight reality. And there's a lot of fighting reality going on. Uh, and as, you know, people in the real estate business, we have a responsibility to understand kind of what's going on behind the scenes so that we can advise people correctly. Because, John, I, I want to touch on this a little bit more. So you, may, you alluded to some of the factors that, that affect why home ownership isn't always a great investment. There is this idea that certain groups not being able to own a home, whoever they happen to be, minorities, mm -hmm. women, millennials, really? for example. Women. It's a big, 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 big discussion. Millennials are not buying houses and oh my God, it's a crisis. Um, mm -hmm. I rent my condo. Um, I know people that are millionaires that rent their homes. Uh, mm -hmm. Peter Schiff is one of them, rents a $4,000 home in Connecticut while he owns Euro Pacific Capital and advises you know, thousands of people on how to grow their business and build wealth and all this stuff. So uh, there's this idea that by not giving people the ability to own a home when they're unqualified, we're somehow blocking them from achieving the American dream. So John, share with me a little bit of why, why that doesn't really hold water. Well, so you're 100% correct. Uh, the likes of Elizabeth Warren continue to push, and, and she's pushing for her constituency, and she uses the terms affordable mortgages. Well, let's talk about affordable mortgages and what that truly means. What it means to me is a mortgage that someone can afford to pay. It, mm -hmm. And to your point, it's not reducing the credit score or allowing a higher debt-to-income ratio or higher LTV ratios to make it so someone can borrow the money. So it, it's been believed by uh, the political class, if you will, that home ownership is a good way to bridge the wealth gap. The one positive of home ownership is the forced savings component that comes from principal reduction. So as you make your payment, so much is going towards equity, it's paying down the principal. So it's like a forced savings account. But to your point about Peter Schiff and, and you renting, what you have the opportunity to do is take your, uh, the money that would have been used for your down payment and invest it and get a positive rate of return on that. When people calculate the benefits and the cost of home ownership, they rarely calculate uh, the op lost opportunity cost of that money that went for towards their down payment. Hmm. And they're certainly not factoring in all the other things, the transactional costs, and that can vary greatly for people that own a home for five years or if someone owns a home for 25 years. So yeah. all of these things factor into that. I don't know if I answered your question, Matt. Yeah, well, I think the problem is people don't look at, <clears throat> they don't look at owning a home as a business. They don't look at anything as a business, but they definitely don't look <laughs> at owning a home as a business. Uh, oh, they, don't, they don't look at it as an investment property, and, and it's not. For most people, for most people, it is a it's a consumer good. You're buying you're buying a lifestyle. It needs to be looked at as an expense uh, versus something else you could do with that money. Now, for most people, 
unfortunately, the only the the difference there is if they actually sat down and analyzed the opportunity cost, they would go, "Well, do I buy a new house or do I buy a new car?" So the only mm-hmm. the, the only discussion is. Right. Where am I going to, like, what consumer good am I going to buy with this? Am I going to buy something that maybe appreciates or am I going to buy something that depreciates five minutes after I drive it off the lot, uh, Greg and his Mercedes? Um, hey, so it was that- used, jackass. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I had to, I had to throw, I know it's used. I just had to throw that jab in there because you have two, you have two cars. And yes, I do. I, and, and Jeff went out and bought a freaking Porsche. Um, yes, my, my Mercedes S550 cost $32,000 walking off the lot dickhead now uh so i want to ask this question really quick you know quick john and chris and this is deadly serious are we as a real estate industry are we honestly doing a disservice to people that are buying homes are we literally crippling the economy in our profession i mean it sounds like we might be doing that well what what i think and i think what john thinks is that We just need to be candid with our buyers. So for 30 years, I've been telling buyers, don't max out. Buy about 80% of what the bank says you can afford. That way you're giving yourself some leeway. If there's a job, if there's a layoff, if your hours are cut back, you're going to be okay. We're not saying, John and I are not saying don't buy a house. Mm -hmm. We're saying know what you're doing analyze it like you would any other financial investment. And then if you make the decision like you did to buy a Mercedes, hey, that's up to you. That's your choice. But, God, but you under the bus. Choice. I haven't said shit all podcast. He's like, oh, this is beat up on Greg. Matt wasn't kidding, apparently. But <laughs> you made a choice. It's a consideration. Most people never give any thought to it. And the one of the things I just want to mention that bothered John and I the most through this whole foreclosure uh, period of time where we were selling hundreds of foreclosures, it was the people that we were meeting, the people that the government and housing advocates said they were they wanted to help were the very ones that got caught holding the bag because they didn't understand the process and nobody mm-hmm. told them costing them and yeah. they got hurt the most. Yeah, that, that is an excellent point because in the end, the, the Goldman Sachs of the world, um, they'll be fine. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're too big to too big to fail, which is such bullshit. But I mean, you, I mean, you, Chris and you nailed it right on the head. Uh, you tell you you act the way I act. I always tell my buyers, buy what you need, not what you want. Okay. I mean, you might want that five bedroom because you have you have a newborn. Well, that's a dumb move because you can afford it right now. Buy a three bedroom, man. Grow into this mm-hmm. stuff. This should be a fun experience. It should not be a negative experience. Like my best friend is buying right now. He's having heart, you know, populations, you know, thinking about how much money he's going to have to spend. I'm going to honestly talk to him and say, dude, you should pump the brakes and just hold off for, you know, until we see how this whole thing shakes out. I mean, you guys, he and his girlfriend can move in together. They can save rent that way. But I mean, he's scared to death. And if he buys now, when he's, you know, when he's scraping together to put the money down, plus using all of his, you know, his, his uh, um, savings, that'd be a horrible investment for me to advise him to go out and spend it because he would have to spend his max amount to get anything close to where you'd want to live in Oakland, California, where you get shot for just standing on a, on a corner. You know, wow. <laughs> no, you really do. One of our, one of our, no, no, this is no joke. One of our admin, she was in Fremont. She was standing out front of a, her house. Some guy drove by, shot her twice. Good, she's, seriously? She, yeah, Leah. She, dude, she's she's alive, wow. but she's just standing there. They just, well, they wanted her things. They just, they didn't wait for them. They just shot her. I mean, so why would you spend money in some area that's just going to depreciate more? Mm. Wow. You know, so you, everyone who's out there is listening to this. Think about the buyers that you're representing right now. Are you gonna Are you gonna push them because you need a commission, or are you gonna work with the right buyers, like Chris was saying? You know, have them buy at eighty percent. Give them that twenty percent little cushion. You know, baby step this thing. You'll You'll get more buyers down the road that way. That's right, and they'll yeah. they'll be more loyal. And the other thing yeah. to keep in mind is the twenty percent differential in house price commission wise translates into very small dollars yeah it really is yeah sorry and that's how you that's how you create raving fans when when someone that you represent understands that you have their best interest at heart and ultimately our jobs all of our jobs are to educate the client and it's ultimately the client's decision i don't force them to spend 80 percent of the maximum 
um, I just inform them it's not necessarily a great investment, but obviously I own a home, Chris owns a home. So it's not that we don't believe in home ownership. It's just um, having an understanding of what the true costs are. Yeah, and a lot of people don't understand that. They, they know what the price of the home, they don't know the cost of the home. And that's the true difference when it comes to buying, mm -hmm. a, buying, a, buying a property. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, why don't, we, why don't we do this? So for some people who don't know that difference, uh, John, go over that really quickly. What is the cost versus the price? Okay, you're putting me on the spot. The cost. <laughs> <laughs> the cost. Well, when, you, when you're purchasing a property, it's not just the price of the house. You're, you're paying uh, prepaid, you're paying attorney fees, you're paying title search and other things. So there's transactional costs on going into the property it's like a mutual fund with a front end load and when you sell the mutual fund it's like having the rear end load too when you have to pay uh again a real estate attorney and most of the time at least in massachusetts everyone uses an attorney and the real estate broker fee so on top of that you have your maintenance and operational costs mm -hmm. right so you're paying real estate tax you're paying other municipal fees you're paying you know, your, your furnace goes and that's uh, 7,500 bucks. You, you have to stroke that check. That's why um, the people that only put 3% down and they're putting every penny that they own into that down payment, what happens if, I don't know, the roof leaks, uh, something, yeah. the hot water heater goes, you know, you might have to stroke a check for $1,000 or up to $10,000 when you own a home. Yeah, and that's that is that is the true difference there, and that's why I, just like you guys, I advise my clients: don't buy what you want, buy what you need, because you need to have some sort of reserves. I talked to my best friend and his girlfriend about that. I said, "Guys, are we putting every penny in the savings and in the gift? In in there are there any savings? They're like, oh no, we're all in. I'm like, good, <laughs> pump the brakes, 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 because mm -hmm. that is the worst thing. I mean, imagine if it shifts, he can't. He's a commercial electrician. What if he doesn't get a job? You know, for two months, three months." Now we got to sell the house and they're at a loss and they lost, you know, years of savings. Worst thing I could ever do. And you guys, by the way, are scaring the shit out of me. Okay. <laughs> just, just, just to be clear. <laughs> we shouldn't be. We're telling you that if our belief on a national average basis that, that we have some more room to go to grow. And um, the, the pro and con of that is the further out we are to the peak, the harsher the fall will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there stop gaps put in place though? I mean, are there stop gaps on the lending well, side? Or are so we going to free fall again? No, let, well, let's talk about the Dodd Frank Act for two seconds, right? So, Chris. That disaster. Here's another hiss, right? But <laughs> there, there are a couple good things that came out of it, right? So, one of them is there are no more negative amortization loans. There are no more interest only loans. There are no more uh, liar loans or, or uh, stated income loans. So we take a lot of those high risk of loans are out of the equation. Now, I mean, we could go on for a 24 hour period to talk about the negatives about Dodd Frank. <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> but, Podcast but, marathon. Yeah. Right? But, but there are some positive things that came out of the Dodd-Frank Act. So it'll okay. be interesting to see how the Trump administration, I know he wants to get rid of it, but I'm hoping some of the safeguards will, will uh, stay in place. And Greg, you mentioned, uh, too big to fail. Chris and I are so upset about too big to fail. We don't believe yeah. any of the institution should have bailed up, been bailed out uh, when they got themselves in financial trouble. It creates moral hazard in the likelihood of it happening again. We don't believe the homeowner should have been bailed out. So we don't believe in bailouts, period. And the Dodd-Frank Act almost guarantees it the next go around. So they have these significantly important financial institutions that have to meet all these requirements. But are we to trust the government to uh, uh, <laughs> regulate them properly and, and that it's not, they're not going to get in financial trouble in the future? I put no faith in that. And when you yeah. designate them as so important that they can't fail, if they do, guess what? You as the taxpayer mean is the tax but we're gonna bail them out again yeah so. bullshit. you know the funny thing is it's like it's like everybody gets a trophy syndrome just oh i played the game oh i want to win everybody yeah. wins no dude if you don't do it right and you cause harm to other people guess what you need to pay the piper 
End of story. It's like anything else. Why are there so many people in jail for murder? You know, say if someone got, you know murdered somebody, Jeffrey Manson, it's like, oh no, you know what? I just God, that was such a mistake. I didn't mean to kill him. I mean, they just tripped and fell on the knife. I mean, like, you know what? Kind of get it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I appreciate that. Okay. Now, are you buying lunch or what? Okay. Good to see that. You know, that's <laughs> essentially what happened. Too big to jail. <laughs> too big to jail. <laughs> Ooh, there's a tagline. I like that, man. I don't have a t-shirt printed up. Can't okay, copy right back, Greg. I will. I'm doing it right now, Matt. Okay. Oh, well, this I is like good it. stuff. This is it really, is good really stuff. good All stuff. All right, so let, let's give people some uh, some recommended reading uh, and resources. So number one, obviously, you guys' book, Easy Money and the American Real Estate Ponzi Scheme. That's at easymoneyamerica.com. That's coming out December 10th, so that's a no-brainer. Um, what what are some of the books that have been influential on uh, on you guys? If people want to dive down that rabbit hole a little bit more and just learn some good, solid uh, economics without it being dry and boring uh, that gives you a nosebleed, where, where can people turn? <laughs> Fragile. Fine. Okay. Uh, is a good one. Yeah, Chris was talking. This is, the, this is the one Chris is talking about. Fragile by Design. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and it's, it's, not, it's not a light read. Yeah, <laughs> but if you want to understand yeah. how the banking industry in this country works, great book. Okay. So Very if you cool. want to be yeah. medically depressed and you need you know, Xanax, <laughs> please read the book, sir. <laughs> what else you got, John? I know you got a couple back there. Yeah, well, I just have a couple. These are the ones, several of the ones that we read as part of the research for the book. Uh, we also went down to D.C. and and met with some of these think tanks. And John Allison uh, was the CEO of. Uh, the Cato Institute, and he was also the CEO of BB&T, um, one of the largest banks in the country. I don't know, it was top 10. Great book. Um, and I believe they were one of the ones that didn't take bailout money, if I remember the story right, of BB&T. Well, no. Yeah, so the, the, the government uh, rules with an iron fist, and mm. even though BB&T did not need the funding, they were forced to take it they were forced and to pay take above it. market rates to offset some of the losses uh, of the TARP program. So they gotcha. forced healthy banks to, to borrow money up at above market rates to offset some of the losses th that the TARP program had. Fantastic. I mean, you, honest, you honestly just wonder why? How, as if everyone, we all know that they're screwing us. They, we all know that. I mean, there's, there's not a, bit a debate there. Why are we allowing that? Why are we not- Who's screwing us? They, well, their government, they're, they're very good at this. Their career <laughs> choice. Their, their, their high school counselor brought them like, you could be a politician. You're a dick. Um, you know, it, wh why are we allowing this to continue? Why are we allowing people to push us around? Why are we allowing the government because saying- Because most hey, voters are- hmm? Most voters are not informed. That's an understatement. To be informed. Yeah. Yep. So because of it is, you know, there's a responsibility with democracy. You need to be informed. And if you're not, and look, John alluded to it earlier. We doubled our deficit, our national deficit, to buy our way out of this. Did you know if you have a child born today, spare, they owe 150 grand right out of the womb. I'm sorry, what? Bring that again? Hmm? $150,000 right out of the womb. That's how much they cost? That's how much they owe no. in government. What well, it is, is that's how much deficit. That's how much deficit we have. Every taxpayer. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So if you have a two-person family, that are both taxpayers, dollars you owe on the, to pay off that debt. That's what it averages out to. Yeah. Wow. My sister has four kids. See, so not everybody's a taxpayer. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, not not everybody's a taxpayer, but yeah, that that is a good. Well, it's it it goes to show you that there's no way we're actually going to be able to pay what we promised. So it's only a matter of time until until we start rolling back the promises. That's that's right. Yeah. And that's when we get. And into our it. concern was uh, a big uh, emotional motivator for John and I is John has a 12 year old daughter. And a big emotional motivator for us, we're saddling that child with all of this debt. Mm -hmm. She's going to live probably a lesser lifestyle than we've lived because we borrowed money against their future. Right. That's horrible. Yeah. Absolutely horrible.
Think we about can't that. end. We can't on, end on that depressing note, can we? <laughs> no, we can't. <laughs> I don't know. Great, come up with something. Oh, I, I, I could drop an f bomb or make fun of Matt or something like that. But that's generally how I roll, no matter what. You know. <laughs> we oh, can't but, end on a depressing note. Well, so here, like, here's here's a positive note. Let's not be part of the problem. Let's get right. educated, and and let's be part of the solution right. by helping people understand why they should not give in to the whole HGTV phenomenon and become, oh, you know, bridezillas when they're out there shopping for a home. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's true. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I think that that's, that's the practical takeaway is it's our responsibility. If we're in the real estate industry, we have to have a better idea or at least a sense of what's going on so that we can help our clients make better decisions that are better for them and if we help them make decisions that are better for them, we will contribute to the solution and at least help people and save them from the pain of what a lot of people went through in 07 and 08 when they lost their house, uh, lost their vehicles, you know, had to declare bankruptcy and all this other stuff. Uh, so let's let's get out there and let's help some people. I mean, that's that's what people are relying on us to do. Um, we may have not done the best job of that the last time around, but let's uh, let's make it this one different this time. Oh, and that's man, the whole purpose of our book. Good. Go buy yeah, the yeah. book. Damn it. So go buy the book. December 10th, uh, easymoneyamerica.com. Really, really good stuff. Um, it will have a blurb uh, somewhere on it or in it or around it or on the website from me um, <laughs> because I enjoyed it. It's really good. It's, it's definitely aligned with everything that, uh, that I've read and aligned with the people that, um, that we all mutually respect, uh, including guys like Peter Schiff, who were calling the last recession as early as 05. Um, when there's like when he spoke to the Mortgage Bankers Association, we should have all known better uh, three years before anything happened, and we had time to correct it then. We didn't do anything about it. Uh, so the more people that are educated about this, the better. So uh, uh, is, that is, is where is this going to be an audio version as well, guys, or is it just in uh, written form? That's uh, to oh, be determined. Oh, no, no, no. So it's going to be in soft cover and hard cover. Uh, we're going to talk to the publisher about that. Um, it pro if it comes out in audio version, it probably won't be it until 2017, maybe early 2017. Good. Yep. My dyslexic butt can Kindle only get version. it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Greg will need to enjoy the audible version. Yes. I do enjoy it, Matt. It's not like soft food. Okay, man. I enjoy it. It's, it's just like reading. It's just like reading. <laughs> it's just like reading. All right. <laughs> so. it, sound, it sounds better in a Mercedes, too. <laughs> yeah. It, well, I, that's actually proven to be true. What is it? A Bose, Bose system there, Greg, in the Mercedes? Yes, it is, Matt. Okay. That's what I thought. All right. Excellent. All right, guys. Okay. With Greg that. Crashing over. Yes, Moving exactly. We, we would normally have Greg give a call to action for the McCann well, challenge, but I you can't. Can. You can. I can. Do. I can. Oh, jump the line. Yeah, well, two things, guys. Okay, jump the line again. You guys, in, when you're listening to this, we're on the recording side. Make sure you turn on all of your notifications so that you know when Matt and I go to YouTube, you know, you know, subscribe to the McDaniel Real Estate Systems. You'll get notified when we go live. Once you get notified, come watch us live. If you're on the McDaniel Challenge and you want to jump the line, I mean, it's not waiting literally over a year to talk with me on a one-on-one -on -one coaching basis. You got to hit me up as fast as you can. Be the first person to do it with the date uh, that you had uh, the McDaniel Challenge scheduled, and we will move you forward. Just for a heads up, guys, the next two Thursdays are going to be Jump the Line Thursdays. As the, we're recording this on November 16th, 2016, just in case you're listening to this in like 2020. Um, and then if you want to interact with me, subscribe to me on Facebook. I do Facebook Lives every single day on the uh, uh, Lead Gen Scripts and Objections page. So if you want to interact with me live there, subscribe to me, and you'll know when I go live there so you can have answer questions uh, when I'm doing the calls. I, right. I came up with a workaround. All right. And uh, so you mentioned YouTube. Also, if you want the audio versions like Greg, uh, blasting out through your Bose system and your Mercedes, uh, uh, you want to go to uh, iTunes, <laughs> iTunes or Stitcher, <laughs> subscribe there. Uh, and then follow me on all uh, social media channels, Facebook especially. If you guys want a question answered during the show, uh, private message on Facebook is the best way to do that. Uh, so look me up. I am pursuing results uh, on Facebook as well as uh, Snapchat and Instagram and all that good stuff. Uh, so make sure to follow me there. Um, we have, who do we have on the show on Friday that I was super excited about? And guys, while Matt's looking for that because he wasn't prepared, um, I will be happy to let you know we're switching over to, uh, we're switching over to Blue Jeans where we're going to be going live into the group. So we're going to be doing a lot more Facebook lives, guys. So be prepared to watch us there. Join the group. It's a great group. That's right. All right. So the uh, <laughs> the episode I had in mind is Mike D'Ambrosio, uh, who's in the Bay Area along with Greg. He hosts a radio show, which has turned into a podcast. He pairs that up 
with old school networking. So this is a classic example of blending high tech and high touch uh, to build a thriving real estate business right in Greg's backyard. Uh, so we're gonna, talk, <laughs> we're gonna talk to him. Uh, he serves like Silicon Valley. He's slightly out of your area, Greg. So he's you got my, yeah, competitors. But anyway, uh, so that's who's coming up on the show on Friday. So until then, everybody, we appreciate you, John and Chris. We appreciate you guys. Yeah. Uh, this was a lot of fun for me and I enjoyed torturing Greg. <laughs> Uh, as always, so I appreciate you guys helping me to do that. And everybody else, we'll see you on the show on Friday. Love you guys. See you soon.